For folks who uh, haven't met me, I'm Tim Mooney. I do Beamline Controls work mostly. And I wrote some of the stuff, and I'm going to describe what's uh, in Synapse 5.8, which, by the way, just went live uh, this morning. The newer, newest version of Synapse is out now. So first of all, what is Synapse for folks that don't already know? It's a collection of Epix modules, Epix software for running synchrotron beamlines. And the idea is that you like to get maybe, if you could, 80% of what people have to do on a beamline in a standard package, and then everybody who needs to do something special can focus all their attention on that special stuff, and then the mundane things will already have been covered in Synapse. That's, that's the idea. Um, there's a web page and a subversion repository for Synapse. So you can get tar files of major releases here, and you can, get, you can export um, major or minor releases from the subversion repository, and that's, that's probably the best way to get to get Synapse, because you can get anything you want. Anything has been tagged, you can get it out of the Subversion repository. And there is a uh, file in, in the Synapse support directory that shows you how to do that. So you don't have to know all Subversion stuff in order to do it. So these are the modules that are in Epix. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. All of these modules um, create some kind of support and export it for anybody else who wants to use it except one in the XXX module, and this one just imports. It doesn't build anything for, of itself. It just imports stuff from everything else, collects it all, and you can make an IOC out of that. Um, there are a couple of other directories in Synapse, so documentation and configure in utils directory that I'll also de be describing. So what is a module? Most Synapse modules contain the following kinds of support. Uh, typically, there'll be some records and device support and uh, maybe some state notation language programs. And some, some uh, modules contain libraries, for example, string calc engines, and there's rectin link library and scan. Um, all of the modules, uh, generally all the modules will contain Epix databases and autosave request files. You already know what a database is. It's basically a program, right? And you can load, if you prepared it right, you can load uh, several copies of a database. So if you have 40 motors, you'll have 40 copies of the motor database. Um, all distinguished by macros. And um, we'll get to autosave later, but it's the person who wrote the database's job to specify which PVs have to be uh, written, saved and written back after a reboot. Uh, and so that information is also contained in the Synapse module. And then, of course, there are display files for uh, MEDM and, and newly CIQTDM and CSS Boy. This forms the default user interface. Um, and I want to emphasize default because when we write these displays, we have no idea what you're going to do, right? These displays are not specific to anything. They are generic, and they just, for example, I'll sh you'll see some, a couple of displays, but there'll be a display for a calc record, and it's just explaining the calc record to you. It doesn't have anything about your application, so if you want that kind of stuff, you have to write it because we don't know what you're going to do. Um, there is also documentation and release notes. Each of these modules uh, is released separately from Synapse. Synap there's a Synapse release, which is just one particular collection of modules, and then in between that, all of the other modules can be updated whenever they want to. Um, some modules contain IOC boot directories, uh, and that's mostly for testing. There are other Epix modules included in Synapse that are, that are, are included with Synapse in the tar file anyway, and also on APS share that are not strictly part of Synapse. Um, so we pull 80 core and 80 binaries out of the area detector. Area det detector is now on GitHub. I don't know if you, you know. Um, those, are in, th those are the only modules that are, that are in the Synapse release. Um, the actual detector modules are because they have to have vendor-supplied software for most of those modules to build. So those aren't included with Synapse. The ASIN module is heavily used by many other Synapse modules. Similar to the IPAC module for all industry pack support. So all of the modules that support ind industry pack devices will use the IPAC module. Seek is the sequencer, which is how you do state notation language programs. It actually uh, compiles and executes those. And stream is a way of doing serial communication. It's a better way of doing serial communication than we have had in the past. Dev IOC stats is, is all about um, telling you how much memory and how many MBUFs or what all kind of resources are available in an IOC. Um, Allen Bradley is purely for PLCs, for Allen Bradley PLCs. And I don't know how, I don't even know whether there are any of those uh, still. 
So <clears throat> the list of modules. The first one, I'm going to go in alphabetical order because I tried to figure out a way to organize this, and I couldn't. The Alive module is new in Synapse 5.8, although it's been backported to uh, Synapse 5.7 at least, and maybe Synapse 5.6. Um, its job is to send operational status to a server so that um, Beamline Controls guys can look through and find out which version of Synapse or of Epix or of VxWorks each IOC is using, where that IOC's uh, support directory or where its uh, IOC directory is located, that kind of stuff. VxWorks boot, boot parameters. And all of that information is available on my web page. So you don't need to write any of this stuff down, by the way, because this entire uh, PowerPoint presentation is in Synapse documentation directory. So, and it's also available on our web page from the, uh, yeah, I think it's available now if you guys have laptops. So the autosave module, the whole point of this module is to allow you to reboot an IOC and pick up right where you left off. So any typing that you did or any uh, menu selections that you've made will be written back into the IOC. It's not an archiver, it only stores the most recent value. <clears throat> and people are all the time confusing this with save data, people including me. So it, it's useful trying to keep the difference. Save data basically writes scan data, it has nothing to do with autosave. Um, and the way autosave works is it's a channel access client and it monitors all the PVs you tell it to look at and whenever any one of those PVs changes, it marks the set as dirty and then the next time, the time, uh, 30 seconds or a minute or however long you specify when that, when that time uh, is elapsed, it writes the, a new, an entire new uh, save file. So it can restore scalar and also array valued PVs. Um, so the save operations uses channel access. The restore operation uses st static database access for scalars. Um, there also is a runtime restore that uses channel access. And arrays are saved and restored with database access. All right, so there's three restore operations <coughs> for the save files. You can do it before record initialization, or you can do it after, or you can do it at both times. And different kinds of PVs have to be restored at different times, and nobody really wants to worry about that. So what autosave does is it normally restores them at both times, and normally that's good. The, almost the only exception to that are motor values. You don't want to restore those after the record is initialized because the motor, might, uh, the motor hardware might have uh, a value in it, and if it does, that value will be used and you don't want to overwrite it. So the busy record, one thing that's important in Synapse that's used all over the place in Synapse, particularly with the scan record, um, is Epic's completion reporting. You might know that Epix has the ability to trace the execution. If you do a CA put to a record, all of the other records that execute as a direct result of that, in other words, via process passive links, Epix can trace the execution of those things. But it can't trace the execution that happens as a result of a channel access client that's putting a monitor on one of those PVs. So that's what the busy record is for. So for example, if you have a channel access client that's monitoring this record up here, and it's going to do something in response to a change in that record's value. You can do a CA put callback to this record, and then it will forward link to this binary output record, which will, with a process passive link, write a one to the busy record, and the busy record will then pretend to be doing something until somebody tells it to stop. And that somebody, in this case, is going to be our channel access client, which has been busy, and as soon as it finishes everything it's going to do, it writes a zero to the busy record, and now Epix knows that the channel access client is done in a way that is compatible with uh, CA put callback. So you will get a callback uh, after that happens uh, to your client. There's other things in there, but that, that's as far as I'm gonna go. Um, you guys already know about the calc out record in Epic's base. And uh, we found out that was such a valuable record that um, we've written variants on that to do other things that the calc out record doesn't do. So the a calc out record handles arrays as well as strings. It can read and write arrays, and it can do array um, expressions. Similarly, the s calc out record can do string expressions and read and write strings. Um, the s weight record is also like the calc out, but it uses rec din link instead of the normal epics um, retargetable links, because this dates back to when there weren't any, when epics links were fixed at boot time. You couldn't change them. And we mostly just keep it because people are used to it. Um, 
you should use a calc out record if you're thinking about uh, using this weight record. Uh, the transform record is like 16 calc outs. It's mostly for coordinate transformations for um, ganging up multiple motors, multiple soft motors to talk to multiple hard motors. I'll show you uh, some examples of that later. And the string sequence record is like the seek record in base, um, but it can get and put strings. And all of these records, except for the transform record, can also wait for completion. And that's an important thing for, I mean, inside the, an IOC, you don't really need this. You can just do a PP link, right? And then your execution will be traced. But if you're writing to a different IOC, then what are you going to do? Epic execution trace is restricted to an IOC. So if you want to trace the execution of, a, of something that happens over more than one IOC, the, the record that bridges the gap between the IOCs and that does the put to the record in a different IOC has to do a put callback itself. And that's what these records do. There's some other code in the calc module. There's interpolation routines. They do uh, Lagrange interpolation. And there's a pretty nice averaging routine uh, implemented around the sub record. And there's a, a, a new in Synapse 5.8 is, um, uh, is a sequence and string sequence record editor. So if you're writing sequence records at runtime, you, I don't know whether you run into this problem before, but you, you write three things and then you think, oh man, I need to put something in between those two guys. It's really hard to do that without errors because there are so many options on the string sequence record. So this guy does it for you. You can just move them all down. So the other thing that's in the calc module are what we loosely call user calcs. Um, user calc is kind of generic for any one of these things, user calc out, string calc, array, all of the records that I already told you about. There are, in most IOCs, there's a database of 10 of each of these guys, uh, plus the user app and interpolation. And these things are intended for users at runtime to do whatever they want. We all know what folks are going to do with these things. Um, and the other thing is uh, the calc has examples of all the calc expressions in all of these different kinds of records, including the calc out record um, on MEDM display, so you can check the syntax. Uh, you don't have to go looking at the manual. I'm not going to say very much about the KMAC module. I don't even know if there are any KMAC crates left at, uh, at APS. But anyway, Mark Rivers wrote this module to talk to, uh, to KMAC crates. C a put recorder is new in Synapse 5.8, but it's also been backported to Synapse 5.6 and 5.7. Um, and what it does is it's basically like the macro recorder on a text editor, where you can just say start recording, and then all of the stuff that you do, your typing or your whatever backspacing, all that stuff will be recorded, and then you press finish macro, and then you can repeat that same thing any number of times. That's the kind of thing that, that C a put recorder is intended to do, except it's doing C a puts. So whether this is setting, typing something into a uh, field in an MEDM display, or clicking a button, or s making some menu selection, or typing CA put on the command line, um, the CA put recorder will record that and write a Python function out of it. <clears throat> and here's the way it works. So you type in the function name that you want here. I got do scan, and then you press start. And from then on, everything that you're doing is being monitored by CA put recorder. And when you're all done with your operation, then you press stop. And then that will, whatever, what you did will show up uh, as a Python function in that, in that file. And then you can refresh the menus, and then that, the name of that function will show up on one of these two menus. And you can select that, and then you can say, do it again. Or you can say, do it again several times if you want to. And you actually can, I mean, as recorded, these macros won't have any arguments, right? They will just do exactly what you told what you, what you did again. And normally, that's not what you want. Normally, you might want to do the same thing to, say, three different motors or m the same kind of a scan, but with a different motor. So you can go in and edit this thing and add your own um, arguments and default values. And those guys will show up here. So you can edit those values uh, So to choose a different motor, for example. Configure is just a directory. It's not separately released. It's, it's, that's sort of fixed for one version of Synapse. And the release file in this directory is basically what defines a Synapse release. It's nothing but a list of numbers, right? It's just a list of the versions of all of the modules that are in there. Um, 
And there is also a file in here that allows us to do a make release at the top level at, in the support directory of Synapse, and that goes through there and edits all of the other modules in Synapse so that their release files all point to the same versions. Otherwise, it's just a nightmare to maintain a Synapse release. So after a while, Synapse accumulates several of these release files. And there are several different versions of Synapse effectively installed all in the same directory. The DAC 128V module is for a specific industry pack uh, D to A converter. Um, you can run it just manually just to do a single D to A conversion, or you can run it to an algorithm. You can generate a sine wave, for example, if you want to. You can use it as a scan positioner. You can use it as part of a slow feedback loop at up to 10 hertz that in ju just involves FX record processing, or a fast PID feedback loop that's entirely done in interrupt server in an interrupt service routine at up to around 10 kilohertz, depending on how much CPU you're willing to give this. The del delay gen module supports delay generators, as you might guess, and there are four or five or maybe six different delay generators supported. Um, I don't know really very much about this module. So this is Don Arms, he's in mom. The documentation director I know a lot about because I wrote most of this stuff. Um, this is about, this presentation is in that directory, and there's also a file, uh, HTML file, that describes what Synapse is and how to deploy it, how it's deployed here, typically, and how to build it, and how to use the XXX module to support uh, a single IOC. And then how to edit all that stuff so that if you want slits and motors and optical tables or whatever. The DXP, I'm pretty sure that Mark Rivers is gonna give a class that, uh, that talks about this. DXP is, for spectroscopy systems. Mostly, if you're gonna do fly scans that involve actually acquiring spectra, you're gonna use this probably. The IP module, IP stands for industry pack, and originally all of the industry pack software support was in this module. And then Mark pulled out DAC and the IP, a couple of IP330 and a couple of other ones. Uh, and the rest of the, what's left is mostly support for message-based devices like uh, temperature controllers or digital multimeters. There are a whole bunch of, of uh, devices that are supported in here. Um, and there is even support for devices that don't have any support. So if somebody just comes to the beam line and they have a, they're bringing their serial device with them, if they know the commands, you can write device support at runtime using Epix records, the string calc and an ASIN and another string calc. Um, to support, at least limited support for this thing. So you don't have to wait until somebody writes support to actually use a device. The IP330 is sort of a pair with the DAC128V. This is the analog output, or analog input <coughs> uh, mate to that pair. And uh, it comes in three flavors. You can, uh, you can do the scan just for sort of period, periodic or manual um, reads of an ADC channel. There is sweep, so this basically is a waveform digitizer. And this is also what you do if you want to record analog data in response to data acquisition triggers in a fly scan. And then there's PID support for, for using the IP330 in a fast feedback loop. Typically, this would be paired with a DAC128V to do the output. The IP Unidig is all about digital I.O. It's one of two digital I.O. modules. Well, there are several different. Uh, but there's I'll also talk about Softly, which is basically a digital I.O. module. The Love module contains support for Love controllers, which are uh, temperature controllers or relays or, I'm not sure that there are any Love controllers left at APS. I know they used to have them in sector one and two, but I'm not sure if there's still any more. MCA is a uh, support for multi-channel analyzers and multi-channel scalers. So if you're doing spectroscopy and you're not doing fly scans, then most beamlines do it with the Canberra AIM module although there's another Ethernet multi-channel analyzer module also. And this also has support for Canberra instrument control bus modules, like um, high voltage power supplies and amplifiers. Um, and it also has support for the, the, the SIS, the struct multi-channel scalers, which are used to, to store uh, counts acquired during fly scans. The MESCOMP module is support for measurement computing, specific measurement computing devices, and I think they're all USB devices. Modbus was originally to talk to Modbus PLCs, 
but it can also talk to other Modbus devices and a lot of panel mount meters, temperature controllers, for example, speak Modbus. And it, it does all the, the three main flavors of Modbus, the TCP IP, serial RTU, and serial ASCII. The motor module is huge, and Ron's going to talk about that later, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I'll give you an idea of what, of what all is in there. The idea is it's support for stepper and also server motors, um, and there is a soft motor also so that you can have a soft motor and then run it through a nonlinear transform, for example, and then talk to a hard motor. Um, um, the motor record supports user and dial and raw coordinates. There's a backlash takeout algorithm, uh, and there's a lot more features that Ron will talk about when he gets to motors. This is a list of all of the motors that are supported by the motor module, and this is also the reason that we can't test Synapse until it's deployed on APS Share, because we don't have this stuff. We've got three of these, um, but all the rest of these controllers are strewn throughout the, the beam lines, and so you can't actually test until you get time on a beam line. The optics module is probably the heaviest user of the motor module because most of the optics uh, that are supported are actually devices that are controlled with the number of motors, for example, slits. All right. And the, the slit support is basically, you can either talk directly, the motors might be directly controlled to individual leaves of a slit. So you can tell this guy to move or this guy to move. And what the slit software does is it also gives you the ability to talk directly to the, the uh, width and the center position of the slit. Um, so monochromators, the non-dispersive double crystal is the standard high heat load monochromator, and there are two flavors of those depending on where the rotation point is. Um, the support for monochromators is done with SNL program, and it supports, uh, you can specify the crystal species, silicon, germanium, diamond, or, or silicon at liquid nitrogen temperature. Um, you can specify the miller indices, and it will calculate the allowed reflections. Uh, and you can, it uses the, uh, the ability of the motor underneath it to actually do calibration. So you can calibrate this monochromator software to a specific energy, and what it actually does is it puts the motor into set mode and it adjusts the motor's um, user values. You can also manage the vertical beam offset, and this automatically syncs to motor position. So if spec, for example, writes directly to the motors, um, this software will automatically understand that and automatically update itself. Um, there are several other kinds of monochromators. Spherical grading monochromator that uh, supports, you can specify the grading line de density and the radius of curvature, tangent arm length, and all the other things that you have to support for, uh, have to specify for a spherical grading monochromator. And it also supports multiple grading stripes because most of these monochromators have several grading stripes. And this you have to manually sync to motor positions if somebody writes directly to the slit motor or the you know, the rotation. Then there are the uh, high, um, high energy resolution, so-called four bounce monochromators, which are basically just dispersive double crystal monochromators. I mean, there's four crystals, but it's two of them basically do all the work. Um, and it's got the same stuff that for the high heat load monochromators, crystal species, Miller indices. Um, and it also allows you to rock just the first crystal or just the second crystal, which is the highest resolution scan you can do or rock both of them in, uh, in synchrony. And it also allows you to effectively tilt the whole world by a few micro radians in case the beam comes in at a slightly different angle and changes your energy, energy calibration. And this automatically syncs to motor position. Uh, the optics module also has support for a number of um, optical tables, mostly six degree of freedom tables. There are four geometries I'll show you later. Um, and there are six virtual motors that you can write to, and they are the, basically the translations of the motor, you know, the X and Y and Z translations, and also the rotations of the table about a fixed point. Um, you can specify the point about which the optical table rotates, and that's pretty important for alignment. So, for example, in order to align an optical table, you can scan until you get the beam into an entrance slit up front, and then you can rotate the table about that slit so that you don't have to, otherwise it's, it's a real nightmare to align an optical table without that kind of stuff. So the, these are the geometries and they're entirely specified by the locations of the kinematic mounts. Well, also the way the legs 
get longer. That, that's different on different um, geometries. But they all support the use and set. You can tell the table after you've aligned it, you can say, this is zero. Call this zero, and, and everything will be relative at that point. Uh, and the table record also sets motor speeds so that the fixed point stays fixed as fixed as you can uh, while the table is moving. It can't, um, the, the motors are going to move at constant speed. It doesn't do trajectories, but it, at least that's as good as you can do with constant speed. The Quad EM is mostly about being position monitors, although I think people are also using them for data acquisition. Um, and uh, so it supports the APS quad electrometer uh, that Steve Ross uh, designed and, and also some commercial versions of, that are similar to that. Soft glue is also support, it, this is the other digital I.O. module that I was telling you about. Um, and this is an industry pack module that contains an FPGA and also digital I.O. And the idea is that you can load a circuit into the FPGA by writing to Epix PVs. So you can autosave and restore a circuit, or you can, you can save a circuit as a text file and then load that same circuit back in. And there actually is support in, in autosave that I didn't tell you about yet that allows you to load a circuit by name just by pressing the button. So you can switch rapidly between, so it takes about a third of a second to load a new circuit into this device. And so, you know, what it consists of is really simple what used to be called TTL uh, electronics. So there's AND gates and OR gates and flip-flops and counters, up-down counters, um, and multiplexers and demultiplexers. And there's also a, uh, oh, and there's also a, uh, um, for the octopole, uh, is a, um, a thing that will squirt a, a word out one bit at a time. Yeah, I can't remember what that's called either. All right, anyway, so that's there. Um, the scan module is um, fairly heavily used. It's, it's mostly for data acquisition, but you can also use it just to program any sequence uh, of events that you want. Um, it's got three pieces in it. The scan record actually executes the scans. There's a facility called Save Data that's a channel access client that looks at scan records and writes data files. And then there's Rec Dinlink, Dinlink that's this library that implements the connections between the scan record and the things that it's talking to because this also predates um, Epic's retargetable links. So just to be clear, a one-dimensional scan is the following. You do this thing end points time. Go to a specific motor position and wait for the motor to get there. Trigger detectors and wait for them to finish acquiring. Then read the data. Then go back to and repeat over and over again until you've taken all the data. And then write that. Then um, Save data will then write that to an NFS file if you're running from VxWorks or just on the regular file system if you're running on Linux. So a multiple scan is the same basically as a 1D scan, except that when you're triggering detectors, one of the detectors that you trigger is another scan record. And it'll just wait for that scan record to do whatever it's doing. The outer scan doesn't know the inner scan is actually doing um, data acquisition. It's just waiting for it to finish. And save data is really the only one that knows that there's a scan happening, that there's a multidimensional scan. So save data looks at all the scan records and it figures out whether this is a 1D or a 2D or 4D or whatever scan, and it writes that kind of a file. Um, I'm going to give a, another talk about this, so I don't think I need to go into too much detail, but I probably should at least give the specifications. There are three types of scans. You can do a constant step scan where you tell it in advance, here's the step size, and just do n steps like that. You can also download an array of the, of the positions that you want the scan record to visit, uh, the positioners to visit. And you can run it in fly mode where you give it a start position and an end position and a number of acquisitions to do in between that time. And so what it'll do is it'll go to the start position, wait for it to get there. It'll launch it toward the end position, but it won't wait. And then it'll immediately start triggering detectors, waiting for them to finish, taking the data, and then triggering the detectors again. So that's called a soft fly scan. And that's a pretty useful thing for alignment. It's not really good enough for final data acquisition, I don't think, but it's pretty handy. So there's no real limit to the number of data points or scan dimensions. Um, you can have zero to four positioners. You don't have to have any positioners or any uh, detectors, triggers. 
um, 0 to 4 triggers and 0 to 70 detector signals. You can acquire from scalar or array valued PVs. Um, it's double buffered. You can acquire a new scan while the previous scan is still being written to disk. Um, and one sort of underused feature of this is that after you've done a scan, you can tell the scan record to look at the data in one particular detector and find a peak, for example, or an edge, or some feature that you want to go to, and tell it automatically to send the positioners to that position. So you can do an alignment um, automatically. Um, I think I'll just skip past this. There is other software, data acquisition related software, mostly for displaying um, scan record data. Scan C is what's still used, unbelievably, um, still used here uh, in most cases. Uh, at least it is for uh, two dimensional scans, for raster scans, microscopes and all. Um, Don Arms wrote D View and S View. And I don't know enough about them to really say anything. But if you need another way of displaying scans, then you need to talk to Don Arms. And Don Arms also wrote uh, some C code that allows you to read and manipulate and write uh, MDA files. And I wrote uh, MDA Python utils to do this similar thing from Python. And then there's MDA Explorer, which you can use to just look at um, data that have already been acquired. It's not very good for runtime use. But the STD module used to be all of Synapse. And every, and, uh, used to be everything that was in there, and then we started pulling stuff out when that became unwieldy and, and uh, packaging it as separate modules. And so the stuff that hasn't got pulled out yet is the stuff that's, that's in STD. And the PID loops, uh, that support for PID loops are in STD. The scalar record is in there. There's another soft motor database, this one that's intended to be programmed at runtime. Um, and then there's a four-step database for dichroism experiments where you basically set a magnetic field in one direction, take data, set it in the other direction, and take data. And then you want A minus B over A plus B, that kind of, that kind of thing. Four-step database does that. There's support for current amplifiers, femtocurrent amplifiers. And there's some general uh, databases for selecting a value for PV history, alarm clock, countdown timer, other just generally useful things that people have found needs for over time. The utils directory is where some of this stuff that I told you about is in. There's MDA utils and the MDA stuff I told you about. Um, this is a catch-all for software that doesn't belong in a module, but it's needed for some purpose or other, either to manage Synapse or to look at scanned data files. Um, so change prefix and change prefix IOC are to allow you to take a copy of uh, an existing IOC and completely change it. So that, for example, if you have one BMA, you can make a copy of that whole IOC and then retarget it to one BMB. And change prefix allows you to do that. Um, there's MDA Explorer and Python utils that I told you about before. And there's a program called SnapDB that's intended to help relieve the congestion uh, that a lot of beamlines have with their user calcs. There are, there are some beamlines that have just an amazing number of user calcs. And they don't really want them to still be user calcs. They know they're never going to change. And SnapDB allows you to take those guys and freeze them into a database and give you a display for those things automatically, um, which otherwise is kind of an error-prone process. And then there are some subversion utilities. So you can log any Synapse module from a specified tag or from the most recent tag. It will write release notes, although it just uses commits. So they're pretty crappy release notes. Um, and you can make a tar file out of any version of any module uh, just by typing make tar. So the VAC module is support for vacuum measurement and control. And um, I don't really know very much about this. This is mostly Moan Ramanathan software. And I'm sort of the mom because I do the subversion commits. But I don't really know very much about it. But it supports um, several different kinds of vacuum controllers um, and ionization gauges. The VME module is all about talking to the VME bus, as you might guess. And it's got a record that's really handy for um, just generic access to the VME bus. So if you've got a new board and you want to write device support for it and you don't really have any clues, 
you can use the VME record to kind of get an idea of how the board actually responds because it's never going to do what the manual says that it was going to do and you need, typically you need to find out how it actually behaves. Um, there is a bunch of device support in the VME module and that's mostly what it is. Device support for the Jorger scaler, uh, the APS bunch clock and machine status, um, Heidenhain encoder, laser interferometer, I mean there's just there's tons of stuff, there's no end to the VME support that uh, in there, but it's mostly uh, device support. So the XXX module, as I told you, this is completely different. This doesn't, this doesn't export anything. This is an importer of everything else in Synapse. And I guess you can regard it as an example of how to use everything, almost everything, not quite everything in Synapse, into a load module, load that into an IOC, and actually run that IOC. And it also provides uh, top-level user interface um, for most of the MEDM displays that are in other, mod other modules in Synapse. Contains command files to load and configure almost everything, sample top-level displays, and the sample script to set environment variables and start things up. So normally what happens when you go to a new beamline that doesn't have any EPIC support at all, you take a copy of the XXX module and you plop it down, you run change prefix to change XXX, as, as it turns out is the, the default prefix for this, to whatever that beamline needs, and then you start editing command files. Um, and if you're really good, you'll make a custom display just for that beamline. Um, that's the way most of the beamlines at APS were originally instrumented. And it's pretty quick. You can, you can do that, and um, it's, it's actually maybe even easier to do the initial installation for a beamline than it is to take a beamline from one installation to the next to upgrade it to a new version of Synapse. So there's two ways to use this. You can make copies and do the procedure that I just told you, or you can just use it as um, documentation, basically. Of if I want to use the calc module, what do I have to link to? Which DVD file do I look at? How do I load the databases? How do I bring up the MEDM displays? Which macro arguments and all that? So it's a, got an example of everything. So that's it for the modules. And now I'm just going to make some sort of general comments about how stuff works in Synapse. Um, for developers. One of the features in Synapse that I think doesn't exist in any other EPIX uh, support is extended processing records like the motor record and the scalar record and the MCA record and the scan record where they'll execute and return but they won't say they're done. So you can write to them again which is normally not true for an EPIX record. For an analog output record while that thing is executing what you told it to do before, you can't say anything again to it until it finishes. But that would be a disaster for a motor because you would never be able to stop it if you wanted to. You know, if you changed your mind, you didn't really want to go into all the way into the wall. The, uh, another thing that's really important in Synapse is completion reporting. This is the response to uh, CA put callback that I talked about earlier. A lot of things in Synapse depend on completion reporting. And it's probably not really true, but I, I sort of pretend all of the databases in Synapse are, will respond correctly to a CA put callback. They won't call you back until they actually did what you told them to do. That's normally pretty easy to do. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, Synapse, I think, are the only records that have rec, rec thin link links. Um, there are actually some GUI standards in Synapse that I think most folks are not really aware of. The colors of all of the related display buttons are highway green and white, right? So you know when you're clicking on those things, you're not going to make anything happen. You're just going to bring up another display. So that's kind of handy to actually notice what's going on. There's a lot of coordinated motions in EPICS, especially in the optics module. And there's a lot of examples of initialization of complex databases because you want to be able to reboot the IOC and pick up where you left off. And if it's a simple database, that's, that's just no problem. All you have to do is restore the values. But if it's a complicated database with internal states, for example, the spherical grading monochromator's got a whole bunch of internal information, that also has to be reproduced. So for databases like that, you need a strategy. You have to actually have records in the database that are intended to take what autosave gives you back and restore the state of the database back to where it was before so that it will function the way the user will expect it to. So coordinated motions and synapse are, are sort of on kind of three levels. The really simple cases you can just do with a database. And typically those are done with transform records. For example, the sled is just nothing but a bunch of transform records. 
In more complicated cases, for the, for the monochromators, it's easier to do it in state notation language because you want to be able to, to it's more of a statesy problem. You don't, you don't want to go until everything is ready to go. And for really complicated cases, um, like an optical table or a scan, I, I think a custom record, I tried to do an optical table in all of the other ways, and I finally just said, this, this is just impossible. So I had to write a custom record for that. Um, so, and we also have developed criteria that a coordination has to have in order to be useful. Number one, it has to respond correctly for CA put callback. Otherwise, you, the user's lives are just miserable. And it's really good if it allows the user to independently talk to motors. And, and it, if it, it, even better if it automatically recovers from somebody talking to the motors and let's say changing their calibration or moving them manually if the overall coordination responds um, automatically to that, it's really handy. Users appreciate that. So I talked a little bit about completion. Actually, I guess I've kind of hammered on completion reporting. Um, it's quite easy to do. If it's just a database in, in a single IOC, all you have to do is make sure that everything is done with PP links. All of the outputs are done with PP links. Epix will automatically be able to trace the execution. Database operations that span an IOC, as I said before when I was talking about the calc module, you have to have somebody does a, does a CA put callback for the link that spans the IOC. And those are the records in uh, Epix that can do that. Um, and the cases in which a channel access client performs part of the operations, I showed you that with, uh, in the busy record, in, in, in the busy module. Um, the database sets the busy with a PP link and the channel access client clears it. And there are also cases in which part of an operation is driven by a CP link. That's becoming more and more common. Um, and that's not any different. A CP link is nothing but a channel access client. But I will talk about initialization problems with, with CP links. If you have a, a CP link to a calc record and its first calculation gives a zero, it's not going to post that, right? Because that record, that value was already posted. So you're not going to know whether you just haven't waited long enough for the value to get to you or whether you're never going to get a monitor from that guy because the record's not going to send it because Epic's records don't send values unless it's different from the last time. So I can't change all the other records in Synapse, but the transform record always posts the result of its, of its first calculation, even if it's zero. And that's been good enough for most of the databases that I've had to mess with. Um, if you need to programmatically initialize a link field, then you got to remember that link fields have to be written by channel access, right? Because you have to you have to redo lock sets, and that can't happen in the database. That has to be a separate task that does that. So PI and I processing occurs before channel access is running. So you can't do that. You can't write link fields at that time. And there is there are new values that you can specify for PI and I that will have it execute only after the IOC is running. And in that case, you can initialize a link field. So last slide. As Synapse is used at APS, many of you already know, it's installed on the master copy called APS Share. And read-only copies of that are copied out to all the BMON. So everybody has their own copy, but it's exactly the same as the, the master copy. And then new minor releases are done by the BMON controls group. They just add a new version of the motor module or a new version of Autosave or whatever. And then there's a new version of Synapse out there. There's a bunch of versions of Synapse. There's 256 versions of Synapse 5.7 installed on APS Share right now. Although you, it's been upgraded eight times, so this is just all the combinations that you could choose. But we have no idea which, um, I mean, that's why we don't number uh, minor releases. There's 130,000 versions of Synapse 5.6 out there, given all the different possible combinations of the modules. But everybody just says, I'm running Synapse 5.7, and then when you actually have to worry about the version of, the, of a particular module, you just go look at the release file and you find out which, what is the complement of all of the module versions that someone's actually running. And that's what defines the, the Synapse release that they really are running. Nobody actually runs Synapse. They all run a combination of modules. So a new major release is done when it's no longer practical to add a new copy of the motor module. And this might be because the new version of the motor module needs the new version of ASIN in order to do something new. You can't add that into Synapse 5.7. You need a new version of ASIN, and if you do that, 
you're going to have to rebuild a whole, you're going to have to add new versions of a whole bunch of other modules as well. And when it gets impossible or impractical to upgrade, then we do a new major release, um, which, which we just did. Um, and mostly this was due to Epic Space and the sequencer and changes in ASIN and, and area detector. So whenever a new non-backward compatible version of ASIN or the sequencer or some other widely used module is needed or a new version of Epic Space is needed, then there's a new major release. 